uh, the planets around low mass stars, PALMS, High Contrast Imaging Survey. So, which one are you? Are you in a Mac? I'll get, yeah, I'll get it out. Oh, don't look. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I'll be telling you about a direct imaging program I've been conducting for my dissertation work at the University of Hawaii, um, targeting low mass stars, so the opposite end of the stellar mass spectrum from what we've been hearing about um, so far today. My primary collaborators on this work are uh, Michael Liu, my thesis advisor, Evgenia uh, Shkolnik, and uh, Motohide Temura. So the vast majority of imaging surveys so far, um, especially when I started this work back in 2010, have been targeting higher mass stars, so intermediate mass stars and sun-like stars for the most part, um, which are, of course, the rarest stars. But if one of the goals of um, this entire field is to understand the galactic census of exoplanets, we really need to go to the low mass stars, which are, of course, the most abundant stars and may, in fact, be the most common planet hosts. So I started this survey back in 2010. Um, the observations are being conducted at uh, Keck with NERC-2, and uh, Subaru uh, with Haichao, which we heard from Motohide Tamura earlier this morning, um, is a powerful imaging instrument. Uh, M-dwarfs themselves have a number of advantages in terms of direct imaging. Uh, for one thing, they're intrinsically faint, so in a contrast-limited regime, we actually, we actually go much deeper uh, than for earlier type brighter stars. M-dwarfs themselves are, uh, have high space densities, so on average, a uh, survey targeting M-dwarfs uh, will be much closer and we can probe much smaller physical separations than for a program targeting high mass stars. Um, they're faint, so uh, the future imaging instruments, uh, for the most part, won't be able to target M-dwarfs, uh, except for the nearest ones. So uh, in that sense, this program will have lasting statistics. Uh, and finally, there's a, an interesting connection to microlensing in that statistical results uh, to date show that there may be a substantial reservoir of giant planets at modest separations uh, from these microlensing surveys. So direct imaging can do two things here. It can both test these, stat uh, these statistics, and also if there is a population of planets, we can begin to image them uh, for the first time. So the sample itself comes from work that my collaborator, Virginia Shkolnik, has been conducting, along with Mike Liu and others, uh, for the past few years. And there are a series of papers I'll point you to if you're interested in uh, the characteristics of the sample uh, in more detail. But overall, they found about 180 uh, young M-dwarfs in the solar neighborhood with distances out to about 35 parsecs, uh, ages less than about 300 mega years. Um, they have a follow-up parallax program um, for which they've obtained parallaxes for about half the samples so far. Uh, and those are in a paper published uh, last year uh, by uh, Evgenia and collaborators. Um, we have high-resolution spectroscopy for the entire sample, so we can vet spectroscopic binarity as being a potentially misleading cause of, uh, poten uh, as a sign of youth. Um, and finally, the entire sample for the imaging program has been culled of visual binaries. Uh, so that leaves 125 targets that I've imaged to date. About a third of the sample um, have been resolved into tight stellar binaries, which I'm skipping over for the deep observations. Uh, the typical age and distance is about 100 mega years uh, and about 25 parsecs. Um, for the deep imaging, uh, the sensitivity to mass is uh, down to about two to four Jupiter masses. And finally, um, it's the largest Im imaging program targeting young M-dwarfs to date. Here's some characteristics of the sample. Uh, for me, the most important is the proper motion, which guarantees that I can confirm or reject candidate planets on a thesis time scale. So that's very important for graduating on time. Uh, the observations are conducted in ADI mode um, using the Loki processing algorithm to remove the stellar flux. Here's an example of such a sequence. Uh, here's a single image from Keck, reduced with Loki, um, derotated and co-added, and out pops a candidate companion. Um, and then I've also been incorporating a large PSF library of thousands of images, um, which helps in particular with uh, sequences that don't have uh, optimal rotation. Um, and also, if there are large variations in AO correction um, due to seeing changes in a particular sequence, the addition of uh, PSF reference library frames has helped with that. Um, and we have dozens of candidate planet uh, detections, uh, the majority of which, well, all of which so far have been uh, background objects. Um, but we also have a number of uh, co-moving stellar uh, companions and a number of brown dwarf discoveries. 
um, four altogether so far, uh, two of which are members of the AB Door Young Moving Group. And these Brown Dwarf Companions are interesting um, because we have over a thousand discoveries of brown dwarfs in the field, but only a small fraction of those are actually have uh, accurate um, age estimates and metallicity estimates um, be, uh, by being benchmark objects, uh, co-moving companions with the primaries. So we can infer the uh, properties of the companion from uh, the primary themselves. Um, the mass ranges for these are about uh, 30 to 70 Jupiter masses, um, and the separations are all the way from about 4 AU out to about 250 AU. But this is an exoplanet meeting, so instead I'm gonna talk about a new discovery um, as part of an extended survey. So rather than going um, deep um, for a relatively limited number of targets, about 80 young M dwarfs, um, I've also started a program um, which is much shallower, about five minutes, but generally targeting a younger sample, so uh, 10 to 100 mega years for the most part, um, which gets me down to about five to seven Jupiter masses, even with this short integration time. And uh, the ultimate goal is to essentially target most of the young M dwarfs in the Northern Hemisphere. So the first result from this extended snapshot program is a young L dwarf companion at the deuterium burning limit at a separation of about 50 AU. The primary itself is an M3.5 star. Um, it's detected in Rosat and Galax, and, uh, which independently places a constraint of about 300 mega years on the, uh, uh, the primary. We have a radio velocity um, for the primary also, which together with its photometric distance, um, we've uh, tentatively um, tagged to the AB Door Young Moving Group, which has an age of about the Pleiades. Um, but we really need a parallax to make any definitive statements about that. But for the rest of the talk, I'll assume an age of about 120 mega years for the system. The companion is at a contrast of six mags. Um, it's been shown to be co-moving with the primary based on uh, two epochs of imaging data. And finally, it has extremely red near-infrared colors, um, just as red as the HR8799 planets, uh, and also the reddest uh, young L dwarfs in the field. So where does it sit on the color magnitude diagram? Uh, here's absolute H as a function of H minus K uh, and H minus L here. The data are from a large compilation from uh, Trent Dupuy and uh, Mike Liu, published last year. Uh, we have our typical M, L, and T dwarf sequence, and what I've overplotted here are young companions with uh, parallaxes for the primary stars. Uh, of course, the most interesting and deviant objects are these uh, young planetary mass objects here, which really form an extension of the old dwarf dusty sequence down to faint absolute magnitudes. And our new companion sits uh, in between uh, Beta Pic B and HR8799 planets. Um, so it's really an interesting stepping stone in terms of its atmospheric properties down to these planetary mass objects. Now we also have uh, spectroscopy, which we obtained earlier this year using uh, OSIRIS, which is now on Keck 1, uh, in H and K bands. And uh, these unambiguously show that uh, the companion is indeed very young. Um, the H band morphology is very peaky, which compared to field objects, uh, which have much broader H band shapes, um, uh, shows that this companion is indeed very young. And also quite red, if you compare it to field objects, you can see that the, uh, uh, it's much redder, um, which is also a sign of dustiness and youth, uh, low surface gravity. So it also has interesting atmospheric properties. Um, when we plot up the predicted effective temperature based on its luminosity and uh, age uh, compared to field objects. So here's a sequence of field objects. Um, evolutionary model predicted effective temperatures as a function of near-infrared spectral type. So we have the usual uh, decreasing temperature down to the LT transition, a relatively constant temperature across the LT transition at about 1400 Kelvin, uh, and then a plummeting around mid to late uh, T spectral types. When we plot up known young companions, the most interesting ones and ones in the literature which are known to be deviant relative to uh, field objects are uh, the HR8799 planets, HD203030, found by Stan Mechev and collaborators in his survey, HNPEG-B, um, and uh, 2 mass 1207 b which for the predicted effective temperature of roughly 1,000 Kelvin for all these objects, they show much earlier uh, spectral types, which is another way of saying that this LT transition appears to be a function of age or gravity. So this is a, this is a known feature which is beginning to be explained theoretically in the literature. And there's some nice papers by Travis Barman and 
Mark Morley on that uh, subject. What's interesting here is that there are a few objects that appear to be also deviant relative to the field sequence um, at earlier spectral types. Um, and also our object, despite having an effective temperature that would put it in the LT transition if it were a field object, also seems to show the similar characteristic of having an earlier than expected infrared spectral type. So possibly another example of this uh, gravity dependent um, LT transition. So what's the mass? That's the most interesting question, I think, for all of us. When we plot up the luminosity and age um, uh, on these evolutionary model predictions, uh, these are from Marley and Simon, the cloudy and cloudless models, we see something interesting. It falls basically exactly on top of the 25 Jupiter mass tracks and the 13 Jupiter mass tracks. Uh, so interesting, also frustrating. But what it really highlights is that given a luminosity and age, these evolutionary models don't always predict unique masses. Um, and that's a result of deuterium burning. So if it's already burnt in this object, then it has a higher mass of about 23 to 27 Jupiter masses. On the other hand, if it's actively burning deuterium, if it's a lower mass, in which case it takes a lot longer to reach the critical temperatures to begin burning deuterium and you get this later delayed bump uh, in uh, luminosity, then it's a lower mass. So this highlights a region in, these diagram, in this diagram that's often ignored or maybe unappreciated um, in the literature uh, for the most part, where, again, a luminosity and an age do not uniquely correspond to a mass. And of course, this is just using hot start evolutionary models. Cold start models will give you entirely other uh, predictions. So altogether, these are sort of lower limits. But we need to be very careful about how we diagnose masses using this diagram. Now, it also raises a broader question of whether other objects fall in this region. And when we plot up known young companions, um, we can see that there are, in fact, a number of objects that sit in this region. So they could both be at the deuterium burning limit, or they could have much higher masses, about twice as massive, closer to 20, 25 Jupiter masses. Now, there may be a way to get around this um, and break this degeneracy. If we have two objects with similar luminosities and similar ages, one having a lower mass and one having a higher mass, they'll have different surface gravities. In the case of our new companion, um, the 13 and 25 Jupiter mass tracks are a difference of about two in mass, so a difference of about two in surface gravity. When we compare it to another object with a similar mass and or with a similar luminosity and age, we see something interesting. Our new companion has a much peakier uh, H-band shape, indicative of a lower surface gravity. And so this is maybe circumstantial evidence that our new companion actually falls on the lower mass tracks, whereas the, uh, this neighboring companion uh, with a similar luminosity and age actually sit on the higher mass tracks. Um, so if that's the case, then this new companion seems to be burning deuterium and uh, seems to be at the deuterium burning limit of about 13 Jupiter masses at about 50 AU. So an interesting discovery. Um, takeaway points, um, PALMS is the largest imaging survey solely targeting M-dwarfs. Um, it's also one of the deepest direct imaging searches, reaching masses down to about three Jupiter masses. Uh, we've discovered four substellar companions to date, and uh, our s extended snapshot survey has already produced uh, a young dusty yellow dwarf um, at the deuterium burning limit with atmospheric properties that are uh, intermediate between beta pic B and the HR8799 planets. Uh, and finally, be careful about how we estimate masses at this uh, deuterium burning limit. Thanks. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Sasha, can we get a mic over here, please? Thanks for a great talk, Brendan, and also a really spectacular uh, job on your thesis. Um, I just wanted to mention that for those of us that are interested in young M dwarfs, particularly in the northern hemisphere, there's um, there's going to be a new instrument being developed at Palomar right now uh, to revive the laser system at Palomar, uh, with the goal of getting something like 80% K-band strels on 15th magnitude stars. So such an instrument would be ideal for following up young M dwarfs in the north. So Evgenia and others, um, we're 
there might be real opportunities for uh, this uh, at Palomar in the future, or Renee. Uh, the instrument is going to be called PULSE. It's something like the Palomar Ultraviolet Laser Search for extra Exoplanets. The time scale is kind of 2015. So we're thrilled that you're coming to Caltech. <laughs> Thanks. More questions? Here? Um, you, you mentioned that you called visual binaries, which I assume you mean greater than a couple arc seconds. Um, but you're looking at M dwarfs for high mass planets, which are going to be kind of on the high mass ratio side. And so they may be forming more like multiple stellar systems. And a lot of stellar multiples turn out to be hierarchical triples or quads after looked at more closely. And so I wonder how you can motivate um, culling your visual binaries. Yeah, so, um, right, the formation processes of all these objects are uh, probably both degenerate and uh, hard to get out after the fact. Um, we are going for the um, visual binaries. We are taking generally quick snapshots of them. Um, but for the most part, we know from um, studying um, young disk systems in, in star forming regions that there's, um, and, and there's some recent work by um, Adam Krauss and collaborators on this, that um, binaries tend to inhibit um, planet formation, or we think they might, because of this um, more rapid dis dissipation time scale. So that's generally the motivation. Binaries between about 5 and, and 50 AU are being called, um, mostly because we think that if we're trying to go after planets and image them, then um, these disks are going to dissipate on a, on a time scale that's too rapid to, to form cores in, in a few million years. One more questions? It's very, oh, pardon me. It's very intriguing to see a case for uh, gravity determination by spectral analysis. And uh, this, I think, especially in this transitional region, is, is certainly uh, challenging, corresponding to something like 0.3 uh, dex difference in, in log g. Uh, but should be doable, I think, if you have good, good comparison uh, templates and so on. Uh, just one thing to maybe to take care of is that uh, metallicity could also have a similar effect. So if you have a higher metallicity object, uh, it might look quite uh, similar to, to a low gravity object. So for that reason, I think it's rather important to uh, um, nail the metallicity of the primary as, as uh, well as we can. Yeah, that's a really good point. And actually, we haven't done that yet for uh, this MDORF. And luckily, there's been a lot of work um, calibrating MDORF metallicities for, for other primarily for RV searches, um, so that's something to, to look at. And this other companion that we compared it to also orbits an M-dwarf primary, so it'd be worth um, trying that for both objects. One last question, last call. If not, yes, okay, last one here. Comment, oh, sorry. <laughs> on comment on the previous question about the binaries, uh, you're right that it seems that the, the formation of planets is inhibited by the presence of a secondary um, stellar companion, but it's also true that um, a lot of surveys are actually excluding those kind of targets, so we don't really know much about them because of that. And I agree that these are very challenging targets to observe. I've done that, and it's really hard. But we should maybe take put a, a little bit more effort because we really don't know what's going on in very, for very close binaries. And this is very important because binaries are very frequent. Okay. That's a good point, thanks. Uh, no, that, that's a good point, thanks. Especially in the era of Kepler where we, we now know that there are um, at least rocky companions at very close separations, um, closer than what we, I think, thought before around tight binaries, so good point. Okay, let's thank Brendan again.